Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii here on a given Wednesday afternoon. The three to four block is always catching up with Kaka'ako because we need to follow it. We promised we would and we are going to follow Kaka'ako. It's the center of our city, the jewel in our crown. We have to know what's going on there and how it will affect our city, our state, and our lives, quality of life, our generation to come. Uh, today we have Henry Curtis, Life of the Land. And the title of our show for this purpose, Henry, if you don't mind, Life of the Land weighs in on Kaka'ako. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so first, let's talk about, let's talk about you. What, okay. is, what is Life of the Land? You formed that organization. No, I didn't. You, I thought you were the founder. No, oh, no. it's a rumor. Life of the Land was founded in February of 1970 by 15 women. Um, our claim to fame in the 70s was that we were the first real pro bono law firm in the state. We peaked with 14 lawyers and 19 second year law students one summer. Uh, we were the group that that forced the military to obey the federal environmental law with our suit over the bombing of Kaholave back in 71. I came to the organization in July of 94. So oh. I've been here 20 years of the 44 and a half years of the organization. Okay, all right. Well, I, that sets me straight on that. It's just, it just seems I, I know you in that role for so long that well, it's been in perpetuity. You know? Well, in Hawaii, people see you the first year and they say, who are you? In the second year, who are you? In the third year, who are you? And in the seventh year, you've been here forever. Yeah, well, it's a good thing, <laughs> actually. <laughs> but as they say, you know, and this is important to our discussion today, as George Santayana said, he who forgets history is doomed to repeat it. Can you say that again? He who, <laughs> you agree with me? Yes. Okay, I did a piece about that recently in connection with Gaza. And uh, there's really a lot, a lot to um, learn from George Santayana. Okay, anyway, so <clears throat> that's life of the land. Life of the land, what, what uh, you know, beyond uh, the environmental, you know, uh, uh, the environmental initiative that, that it did way back when, what else has the life of the land done? What's it done under your administration? Um, some of the proudest things that were done under my administration is we're the group that got Hawaiian Electric to admit that climate change is real and that fossil fuels are part of the problem and part of the solution. We also worked heavily on getting this. Uh, we don't normally work in the legislative arena. We occasionally are there. We were, were played a major role in getting the Act 230 passed, which requires public disclosure of key members of boards and commissions, uh, 18 boards and commissions. When Governor Abercrombie came in, he said, transparency is the hallmark of my administration. You're quoting now. Right. He, he fired the head of OIP, and he went into a slightly less transparency. <laughs> you know, he, he didn't win. No, it's, he didn't. it's okay. It's all history now. <laughs> and on Oahu, he got hit harder. He lost by a larger margin than any other island. Isn't that interesting? You would have expected that he would have, you know, been, been hurt on the neighbor islands, but yeah. not. What do you make of that? Well, let's have a digression for a moment. Well, we don't ever, as an organization, we never take positions on people, whether for administrative posts or political posts. Um, but it's amazing that in a primary for a sitting governor, it appears that no other governor in the United States has ever had that big a defeat. So that is wow. What do you attribute it to? I attribute it to the fact that through a varying sort of bullying style, um, he deeply angered a whole bunch of different sectors of society. And when you add them all up, there was no way he could win. Yeah. And more than that, he lost badly. Yes. So what about 17, environmental? Sorry, go I'm ahead. Sorry. He won by 17%. He lost by 35%. That's a swap of 52%. Look what happened in four years. Amazing. Yeah. Was, now, what, what, did, what role do you, do you think that environmental positions he took uh, undermine his popularity? Um, I picture environment as just one. Well, let me step back because um, Life of the Land believes that um, environmentalism is like wearing a pair of green glasses you see everything, but you see it from a different perspective. 
a number of environmental groups see it much more narrowly. They see it as uh, ecosystems and whatnot. So I, I picture Life of Land as having a, a sort of broader view than a lot of traditional groups. So when you say what environmental issues, I picture you're asking more of the, the more narrow, what specific land use, water use, well, I mean, like you're trying to remember uh, what you know what he said four years ago, and I'm sure we can include in that. He said, "I'm going to protect the environment." Yes, he and, said he's going to protect maybe there the was environment. A disappointment on that level. Yes, he went immediately to executive orders to fix highways, to move the Nene out of Kauai, which is kind of funny because the Nene, which were not interfering with planes, were moved to neighbor islands, have flown back to Oahu, and are now up by the wind farm. <laughs> uh, so they had to modify their habitat conservation plan. <laughs> Where they are. <laughs> um, but if we look at Kakaako, for example, he was against HCDA. Um, and you mean at the beginning? And in the beginning. Um, and when there were proposals to modify, um, to really bring in commercial things, when he was in the house, he was concerned about that. But coming here, it was like he did a 180. Um, and then he didn't even show up on your show at the Capitol, where you, on July 1st, had a forum for gubernatorial candidates to talk about Kakaako, and he didn't even bother to show up. The rumor was he was up in his office listening on the, uh, the internal uh, video system. That's wow. the rumor. And yet I remember um, a number of years ago where he spoke at the Pacific Club closet club, one of these clubs. Um, and he came in to talk about his vision for Kakaako. And he said, after he lectured us all, he said, um, I will be available for other talks if you want me there. And when I'm elected for my third term, and I thought, wow, we have a law against three terms. Maybe he thought he would change the Constitution yes. in the middle. He had visions. Well, I guess, you know, that raises an interesting question. I mean, I was asking originally about, you know, uh, how much and to what extent his uh, environmental positions, you know, as they were rolled out during, during the term, affected this, this huge loss that he had a few days ago. And then I thought, you know, maybe something you said made me think, well, part of that was Kaka'ako. Yes. And I think that people, I'm just throwing this at you, see if you agree. I think people saw, rightly or wrongly, the administration in backroom meetings with big, you know, heavyweight developers encouraging them to build these big, you know, tall pie in the sky, you know, 790 feet projects, um, you know, without trying to cut the corners on that. And I, and I have a feeling that, that people thought that. They thought that he was behind some of that or all of that because that was his rhetoric, at least at the outset you know, when, when all that started, um, and they held it against them. And uh, they don't like that, and they still don't like it. I, I just wonder what your thoughts are about, you know, assigning some of the, you know, sort of the opposition to Kaka'ako to Abercrombie. I think a number of different groups would take what his position is in Kaka'ako and oppose Abercrombie's approach on a number of different issues. Some felt that we have a 400 foot height limit and putting up six, 700, 800 foot buildings just doesn't, isn't Hawaii. Um, some, some I'm sure said, well, okay, infilling is okay if you preserve the country, which is what he said, but at the same time he was developing the country. So you don't preserve the country by building in the city and then build in the country also. And I felt there was a lot of, um, a lot of backroom, non-transparent things about it. It would be easier if somebody comes out and says, this is what I'm going to do. It would be nicer if I listened to the public, but to just sort of come up with a plan in the back room and then announce it as this is the way we're going to do it. I'm governor, I can do anything I want to. That, that doesn't play well. Yes, and, and well, I guess my question is, do you, do you feel from you know your you know arm in the, your your do-si-do, -si -do, your do-si-do -do in the in the community 
that this was something that people didn't like. That they, not, it's not only you and me, but uh, the people in general felt this and it was part of their voting process. Yes, I'm, I, I, I get the sense that large segments of the society were turned off, sharply turned off in a number of areas, Kakako was definitely one of them. Yeah. Okay, so going from there to what, all that considered, what do you think the public, I know that, you know, you're not going to find everybody agreeing on this, but what do you think the public thinks about Kakao? The public such as they are, you know, and the way, the, the degree to which they're educated and thinking about it at all, what do you think? And like for example, on the July 1st uh, gubernatorial thing, I had the impression that the public is not really thinking at a high level on this. They're not thinking about planning and public spaces and, you know, 20, 30 years ahead and let's make a, a community that will work for our children. I didn't think they were thinking that actually for the most part. But what do you think the public is thinking about in terms of Kakahaka? You're right. I think there's um, a real there are some people who live there, there are some people who work there, there are some people who play there, there are some people who are none of the above, there are some who party there. Um, it was easier, say, in 2005 when A and B said, we're going to build some tall towers, and there was the red shirt movement to stop the development on the Mackay section. Um, now, with many different moving parts, with the proposal for the Obama Library, with the proposal for OHA, with the proposal for Kamehameha Schools. There's a lot of different moving pieces. And while there is still a hardcore resistance, it's more diffuse. Yeah. Yeah. So would you, would you, would you say the public is fully informed about this? And if they are not fully informed, what is missing in the mixture? Wow. Take a whack. <laughs> take, just take a whack at it. <laughs> not um, to worry. <laughs> I, I, th I think what's missing is the planning of where we're going. Um, and, and it's the thing, if we take a digression to Hawaiian Electric for a moment, the Public Utilities Commission came down on, the P on HECO in April saying, you have a whole bunch of pieces, we don't see the full picture. And I think that is the same thing in Kakako. There's fear that there's all kinds of high rises coming, but people don't see the big picture of what's there. Okay, that's a good place for a break. Okay. That's Henry Curtis. Uh, he's not the founder, but he is a, an important person, can I say that, in life of the land for the past 20 years. And today on Think Tech Talks, we're catching up on Kakaako and we're calling the show Life of the Land Weighs In on Kakaako. We'll be right back after this short break. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here at Think Tech Talks, catching up on Kakaako on a given Wednesday in the three to four block with Henry Curtis of Life, in, in, uh, Life of the Land. Um, and so uh, I guess the question is, um, what should a proper plan be for Kakaako? I know you thought about this. So let's make you governor for a moment, Henry. What should the plan be? What would you uh, advocate? First, um, I would, th the first picture is we need to diversify our economy. So we need to have areas for agriculture. We need to have areas for industry. We need to have areas for residential. And we need to have sort of that big picture of what's going to go where. Um, within residential, we need to have houses for all the different people who live in this state. And our first priority should be having the homes for the people who live here. There are, there's a waiting list for DHHL. There's um, a lack of affordable apartments. There's a lack of different types of housing for our residents. So um, that would be the next step. And if developers are madly racing into an area to say, I want my big building, and the next developer says, I want to have my next building. That is a time to say, OK, what can we get from different developers that would maximize what we need? Because clearly, there are plenty of developers out there who want to build something. And, and the focus should be on, on meeting our needs. OK. 
So a lot of what you're talking about is a question of degree. How much, where, not here, but maybe there. Uh, big, but not that big. Um, so it really requires governmental a settlement, um, an establishment of parameters by government. And, and government and community. Right, right, in a conversation. Yeah. Yes, in, in a, a conversation. conversation. I, and I think that's, you know, let me, let me add a point on that. I, well, while we were preparing for the gubernatorial forum on Kaka'ako, in fact, while preparing for the, the previous think tech discussion, I think you were there. Yes. Um, on Kaka'ako. We had everybody at the, you know, there must have been 12 speakers. Right? Um, you know, I caught this thing by a guy named Kimmelman. Uh, Kimmelman is the New York Times uh, architectural critic, among other things. And he went to Yale and gave a talk on public spaces. And I've always had an interest, I'm sure you have too, in exactly how you organize a city. Because right. the city is, uh, it establishes the quality of life. Uh, even, even if it seems hard, concrete, and all that, still, the way you move in a city, the way you get from place to place, the way you spend your time, it establishes the quality of life. And he was talking about a renaissance in this. You know, years ago in ancient Rome, they were thinking about this, and we have really stopped thinking about how the public moves, how the public enjoys the public spaces. Uh, so in this country and in Europe, this is a big deal now. And that's what he spoke about at Yale. It's, it's on C-SPAN if you ever want to find okay. Michael Kimmelman. Um, so I'm thinking that that's, that's where we should be here. We should be evaluating public spaces. The, and to, the, to your point, the public must be involved in the conversation. How can you possibly have a few that designing you know, public spaces for the public without, without commentary from the public? Uh, this is perhaps our greatest, our greatest collaboration, that we can build a city we like. Yes. And no one can say that Honolulu is well designed. Nobody can say that. It is not well designed. And any architect would admit that. Any planner would admit that. And, and for strange reasons over the years, and including during statehood, when we could have built a beautiful city, we didn't. So now here we are, and maybe it's the last clear chance to actually do that. How do you create this conversation? Who do you call on? Which foot do you put out first in order to get this done? It's an important question because if it doesn't happen now, it may be too late for it to happen in time. Yes, wow. I agree with you. I certainly don't want to be the governor for designing this. <laughs> it does need to involve lots of different players and it needs to have some kind of design. I, I've been on cities in the mainland where they have very wide sidewalks that encourage the public to come down. It encourages sidewalk cafes. Um, I've been in areas that have canals, that have parks, that have different kinds of public gathering spots that are, that are designed to make a city a city. Um, and I think we do it too haphazardly here, where some have suggested putting parks inside buildings as, as a way of meeting the park space. You mean like Kamehameha schools? <laughs> Um, I mean, that, but it's just a guess. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, how we design it. And part of it is being open to participation. Um, bringing in a good facilitator or good facilitator team is one way of eliciting public comments as opposed to bringing in a facilitator which herds people into the plan that has already been developed. Um, so it is a ground up approach. It is a democratic approach. Democracy takes a little longer than dictatorial policies, but you get more buy-in that way. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I, we're going far beyond just Kaka'ako for a moment, but this, it's, um, it's a new world these days. Yes. And this conversation actually can and should take place in many contexts, not only Kaka'ako. It's a new, actually, it's a new gloss on government. It's a new gloss on w the way we rule ourselves, the way we, you know, agree on things, the way we build our structures and regulate our structures and the way civilization, at least in this country, works and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So the, the problem I have, and maybe you can help me with this, is if I have a meeting and I say in a, in a newspaper of general circulation or in media of general circulation, 
If you are interested in, say, Kaka'ako, come on down. Come to this meeting. It's not next week. It's three days or whatever it is. It's not, it's not an ongoing meeting. It's one day. And express yourself. And if you want to write us letters, write us letters. If you want to make statements, make them so that we can hear them at this meeting. Okay? So we go to the meeting, and we have a discussion, and we say that, okay, the maximum limit in this area should be 400 feet. Let's assume we agree okay. on that. And um, there's a consensus. Not everybody agrees. Some people want 500, and some people want 300, but there's a general consensus. I mean, right now we're working, as you know, with something called the Live Sift, which is a forerunner of computer voting. Yes. You know, of network voting. It's not only asking questions, it's answering questions. And, and you can, you know, have a pie chart in, in a matter of seconds to know what people think. And, and I think this, this is more than just Q&A. So suppose at this meeting we decide it should be 406 feet. Okay. How do we make that stick with our form of government? How do we make everybody belly up to the fact that it was settled there and then, and not have someone in the following week say, no, 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 I know I was there, I know I said I wanted it 350 feet, but I don't agree uh, with the result and I am gonna continue my crusade for 350 feet. How do I prevent that? How do you, as governor, how do you <laughs> prevent that? <laughs> I'm not suggesting this seriously, but one way would be, um, if a politician, because politicians are able to change it, if a politician ran for office and said, I believe in these five things, these are the five things I'm really firm on, and if I renege on more than two of them, I will don't, no, I will donate a million dollars to the campaign to unseat me. <laughs> I'd like to see that get through. Uh, yeah, that's, um, but, I really but would. <laughs> one of the problems is that Hawaii is famous for making studies that then gather dust on the shelf. And, and create uncertainty. Yes. And so a lot of people within the public feel frustrated about turning out when they know that what they have to say is just going to be ignored. And Kaka'ako is sort of the f perfect place because it's in an urban setting a lot of people want to see sort of Kakako designed to be something. Um, there have been a lot of community organizations and a lot of developers and government coming out. Um, but, we're, but it's unclear whether anybody is listening. Yes. And uh, how, do we, how do we do that? I mean, I, if, if, if I'm, I'm going to be you for a moment. I'm going to be okay. governor for a moment. So look, I want to I want to hear you guys out, and um, I want you to come forward and help me. I don't want you to just, you know, uh, snipe at me o over years and years. I just want you to come join me, make a decision on this issue, and this is what we've been talking about on such a night. Uh, and by the way, if you want to get on the internet, you can, and you can ask me questions. You can uh, file your opinions. You can vote in a sort of straw vote kind of way. All right. So this happens. It happens at a time of convenience when everybody who, you know, leads a regular life can participate. And we vote for 350 feet or whatever okay. number of foot. Okay. <clears throat> now I say I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to abide by what you say. I'm going to bend every effort because I gave everyone an opportunity and you all came and this is the consensus, if not the majority vote of that crowd. I'm going to push for that. I'm going to try to get all the structures around to agree with that. Um, would this work, do you think? Could this? I, I know that sometimes the legislature would not agree with the consensus model, right. and they outvoted for reasons that uh, you know they think are good, um, and, and judges aren't bound by it for sure, uh, nor city councils. <laughs> but but would would this be worth trying? I certainly hope so. Um, I certainly hope so. I. I hope so. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about what is actually happening in Kaka'ako. Okay. And what, you know, your feeling is about it. Let me sort of paint the picture and you can repaint it if you like. We have a lot of big buildings going up fast. 
the city is pretty much excluded from participation in a lot of the design elements. HCDA is, is running that, and they get a lot of waivers and variances, and, and they have a board which may not be professional planners issuing those waivers and variances, and people don't like that much. We have a lot of concerns by the community that are not being answered. Um, we have, um, we have um, um, situations where you don't, where you're not sure that concerns are being met, for example, the schools, the parks, the infrastructure, uh, and there's nobody out there to actually respond to that. No action is, is being taken, I don't think, about some things. And the legislature of the state of Hawaii may not be in a position to correct them by the time the legislature is seated. Um, and so, you know, what, what, what's wrong? Is that, is that what's happening? Is there more happening? Uh, what can we do about it? Oh, and the big thing is, this is my big capper thing, is that there's a lot of people, young millennial people, who see Kaka'ako as a place for them to gather and make their lives. And business, recreation, uh, living, you know, live, work, learn, and play. Um, and that may not come true because at the end of the day, the neighborhood's going to be dominated by structures that don't permit that, arguably. Um, what what can we so tell me your view of these issues and tell me your view of what can and should be done once the state or the county designates an area for urban development it seems to me there are two types of landowners one type of landowner wants to build something that is totally allowed within that area and there is they have the right to do that the second type of developer wants a variance or a series of variances to do things that are different. Go above the height limit, add to the d density, encroach on the sidewalk, whatever. You take all of the people who want the variances within that area and you have them each submit a plan to a neutral board that is not that doesn't have developers on it. And then they get to look at them and look at um, against a set of criteria, affordable housing, uh, public space, uh, wide sidewalks, whatever. They look at it against a set of criteria and get to pick sort of the developers up to a certain point that, that offer the best of the public interest, which pits the developers against each other <laughs> and forces developers to say, well, I'm going to provide more affordable housing or I'm going to supply wider sidewalks than are required in order to get this other variance. And that way you would both be supporting development and supporting housing and supporting the labor market and supporting construction and supporting developers, but at the same time providing a key, key services in the public interest. And the losers would be the developers who want all kinds of variances but don't want to give anything back. Right. So that would hold their feet to the fire. Yes. That's Henry Curtis, uh, Life of the Land, here on Think Tech Talks, catching up on Kaka'ako. Uh, Life of the Land weighs in on Kaka'ako. We'll be right back after this short break. Okay, we're live. We're at Think Tech Talks. We're catching up on Kaka'ako here on Wednesday with Henry Curtis of Life of the Land. And Life of the Land is weighing in with some thoughts on Kaka'ako. You know, one thing is I think it's fair to say that the state of Hawaii, among or the county of Oahu, anyway, of Honolulu, has has uh, failed to do is uh, is build adequate housing for the people. Uh, you mentioned that, and I think everything everybody agrees. You could ask anyone this question, and they will all agree that we don't have adequate housing. Uh, now, you know, you could you could make an extended argument of that and say, well, uh, we have to build every kind of housing of every kind, including you know, fifty million dollar condo penthouses. But that's not really the answer. It's the it's housing for the people, as you mentioned. So the question is, oh, and, you, and you're talking about developers and trying to get them in line, trying to get them to agree to reasonable parameters and not, and not, you know, not take advantage. How about this for a thought? You know, Henry, there aren't enough developers. There should be more developers. If there were more developers, there'd be more housing. And I mean young developers. I mean developers out of the business school in, in UH. I mean developers who are local, who understand the issues we are talking about. 
developers who would build for the people. Why don't we have more young developers? I can't even think of any. I can think of older developers and development companies from far away, but I can't think of young local developers. Why don't we have them? Wouldn't that help? It would. Um, w when an economy has a lot of commercial establishments and hotels and, and high rises that are owned by people who aren't from here, you lose, you lose that sort of local control. It's fine to have some foreign investment, and by foreign I mean out of state, but there should be a lot of development by locals within the state. Um, and certainly, I would hope there's young developers and architects coming up, um, but. Uh, I, I would encourage, you know, it's like we, we have all these startup programs and we show them how to be startups, we show them how to take risks, we show them how to raise capital. We never talk about real estate development because that's like old, <laughs> passe. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, and kids everywhere, how about being a developer? Why don't you consider that possibility? <laughs> we, we could tie it into high tech because it could be, we want LEEDs certified buildings. Right. We want wide sidewalks. We want modern transportation. <laughs> We want, you, there are ways of designing, um, let me use the University of California at Santa Cruz, where it is easier to walk between buildings than to drive between buildings, because the roads twist and turn all the way around, and there are just paths that take you That's there. That's great. <laughs> so there are ways of designing communities that have bike paths, that have different amenities, that can have commercial sort of wedged in. Um, I've often thought that, that we, we have a bike path, for example, on the North Shore in, in Wailua, Haleiwa. We have one along Pearl Harbor. Why not a bike path that connects Pearl Harbor to the North Shore? Why not have a bike path that connects Aloha Tower with, with Waikiki? If I you mean, have you that <laughs> lay of, of parklands that was originally visioned that would go all the way from Waikiki down to Aloha Tower, you have that sort of lay of parklands. You could have paths for both pedestrians and different paths for bicyclists along that, and you'd be opening up the shoreline to the public. And that, what would this cost, Blupkis? Not this if you cheap. <laughs> Blupkis is cheap. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and developers could be given areas to develop within zones and to support sort of the public use of the shorelines. <sighs> Got to get this going, Henry. So uh, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, what happens if there is no conversation. Um, let's talk about what happens if, if we leave, which is you know, actually the greater possibility, I'm sorry to say, if we leave things in the, you know, in the current status quo and it just moves on. What, what's your expectation of how the social process, the legal process, the development process will work in Kaka'ako. I am by nature an optimist. By nature, I believe things will get better. Um, I think the work that we do in the public sector would be really hard to do if you were a pessimist. Because if you surround yourself with people who believe that there are positive solutions down the road, you're far more open, you get far more things on the table. Um, so I'm optimistic, and I believe that our next governor uh, may be more of a conciliatory person than um, sort of the brash, I know the way to go. Mm -hmm. well, I guess, so what can an organization, I mean, there are other organizations we can and should talk about too, but what can an organization like Life of the Land do? You know, have you taken any affirmative positions in public? Have you advocated for anything particular in Kaka'ako? Um, and, and what could you do if you, you know, were going to make an attempt at that going forward? What, what would you say? I would say that the sort of biggest change um, at Life of Land is that we are more um, supportive of communities and giving sort of background support um, rather than stepping in and saying this is the way things should be done. 
So whether it's land use, whether it's water use, whether it's energy policy, we want to see how the community feels about it and to support the community. So we're not the lead group in Kakako, we're a support group. Okay, I mean, you, you, does that let you establish policy? I mean, wouldn't it be better, Henry, if you got up and said, look, let me, sh let me show you our connection, our, our analysis, here's the chart, here's the graph, here's our conclusions, here's some, you know, comparable organizations on the mainland had similar problems. Why don't you consider these things? We, we want to suggest to you something you could be thinking instead of just waiting for them to tell you. I would um, love for Life of Land to be able to do that. Right now, I don't see that we have the resources to do that. It's a resource question. Uh, resource and, and people, the fact that we have two powerful voices at Life of Land right now, I deal heavily with energy issues. Cat deals heavily with social issues. Uh, bringing on a third person to work heavily on land use would be fantastic. Um, that is something down the road that would be great. I don't see it tomorrow. Okay, well, what, what advice would you, let's, let's make them the public. What advice would you give them, it's that camera over there, uh, about Kaka'ako? Um, I think that what the community has done in Kakako, uh, Ron Iwami and others have really brought together the community in a very positive way and I would fully support their moving forward. Can you be more specific? Um, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't rehearse this, but I really enjoy the way it's going. <laughs> and I like the guy behind the camera back there who I can just see against the screen as sort of an image of a person who might be from Kagako. It's just a cutout against the screen, that's all. <laughs> well, I see the knees bouncing. We do have a studio audience. <laughs> um, I, I see that the that there are already organizations and entities in Kaka'ako who have come up with visions. And I think they need to be at the table with the policymakers and with the developers. Um, I, I, but the, the most important thing is that when you come up with a plan, when all the people around the table are coming up with a plan, there's some assurance that that plan will actually be implemented. Um, it was in 2006 what was the act? Um, oh, one, the one that zoned uh, Mackay? Right, Act yeah, 317. Was, I call it the Calvin Say Act myself. Okay. <laughs> Calvin Say was there. Linda Lingle agreed to allow it to become law without her signature. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people were involved in it. Um, it sort of set the policy of where we were going in 2006. And then OHA, I think, got screwed on the settlement. They settled for way too little, and they settled for the wrong area there could have been a far better package given that would not have altered the 2006 agreement. Would you alter the Calvin Say Act now? Um, I think it was good when it passed. I would not alter it, but I would give OHA a different piece of land and different set of money. Let me factors. throw a theory at you, Henry. See what you think. <clears throat> oh, uh, OHA knew the deal when they made that arrangement with Governor Abercrombie. They knew that it was, you know, going to be hard to build there. They knew about the Calvin Say Act, 2006, you're right. Um, they, they knew that it was going to be a big problem and it wasn't worth as much as what they were giving up for it. They knew right. that. Uh, they, you know, presumably for that kind of money, you would have somebody study it and advise you. Uh, and I think probably it's fair to assume that in those discussions, there was a little something which said, don't worry, boys, we'll make this happen for you later. That is definitely the sense within the community that, that not only was the deal that way with the governor, but it was also a way of saying to developers, don't worry about this agreement, you'll get your high rises because OHA will step in and will put a wedge between the community and government. Um, and so OHA got used and they 
were willing to settle for less than they should have. Yeah. So it goes to the question of whether Mackay is different from Malka. I think it is. Why? Is, is Mackay uh, a sanctuary? Is Mackay unbuildable? Was Calvin Say right? Is he still right today? Let me preface what I'm going to say with two statements. One, I think, was more than Calvin Say. I think there were I a agree number. with that. But Just a reference. But we can use that as a reference. Second, I need to be careful because um, life of the land has a position on it that is not necessarily my position. And I'm associated with life of the land. Um, and normally, we line up perfectly. But on Kakako, there's a slight divergence. Um, so I'm going to say how I feel now, and this statement um, is my opinion. I think the 2006 agreement should be binding on the Mackay section. Good for you, Henry. I feel the same way if it's of any interest. And I remember so well what happened in 2006. I remember all the factors. And as a matter of fact, this may interest you, that, that A and B, when they folded on their three condo tower and right. uh, their point panic, um, they did it on my radio show. I'll never forget that. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the good old days. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Henry, it's wonderful to talk to you. I hope we can come back and do this again um, in other contexts. Awesome. Not this issue and other issues. It's nice to have you on the show. It's, it's nice to It's great being here. That's Henry Curtis, uh, Life of the Land. We're catching up on Kaka'ako today with him. And um, I guess we can say that both Life of the Land and Henry Curtis weigh in on Kaka'ako. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> My name is DJ. I'm going up with ThinkTech.